Hello everyone. We're live. Welcome to our second Association of Independent Promoters Masterclass. This one is the future of live music. She's going to rest on the shoulders of these two guests. Maz, who joins us from London, and Clemence, who joins us from Lisbon. Um, this is all being brought to you by Atom Promotions, who are in Worthing. So Tom is here in Worthing, and I'm John Ostrin. I'm the chair of the Association of Independent Promoters, and I'm in Glyndovdwy in North Wales. And I want to say Glyndovdwy because it doesn't get said broadcast very often. So I wanted to give you that. So thank you very much for coming in. So we've got these two masterclasses. So we ran the first one on Monday uh, with Connell Dodds, who runs Crosstown Concerts. And we talked to him about his journey uh, into music, but mostly about the sort of different tools that he uses and the things that he's learned over 30 years in promoting um, and the things that he's learned to do and the things he's learned not to do. And we found that very useful. We had a lot of questions uh, from people uh, in the comments in the chat. So you can, as we talk today, um, please put, uh, respond to that with comments and questions. And Tom, who's behind the scenes, will be looking at those and we'll pass those through to me to pass on to our guests. Um, and uh, yeah, so just keep, sort of keep in touch and let us know. We'll run a few polls as well through the session, which will help us um, or help you respond to some of the questions and some of the things we're thinking about. So Tom will probably put up a poll quite quickly, um, which will just help us um, see who's in the room, so to speak. So a lot of people have registered to be here. So we, we know who all you people are, but there'll also be people watching on Facebook and YouTube as it's dream. So you can fill in the poll and that will help um, us know. So this is aimed at mostly at people who are concert promoters um, or people who are going to be concert promoters or would like to be concert promoters. So please forgive us because we are going to be using some terms and terminology which concert promoters uh, know and love or hate, um, but we're not going to explain what they are because we, um, mostly because we expect you to know what they are and because it, it's about trying to help you develop your practice and your work. And we are going to talk about COVID-19, but we'll do that towards the end because we, we want to sort of work our way through what it's like to be a concert promoter um, through all times, good and bad. Uh, but we will reflect, of course, on COVID and we'll talk to um, Maz and Clements about what they think um, the changes are going to be as a result of that. So the first poll is up. So please press that button and I'll see that as it comes in. Um, the first part of this is what we're going to do to start with is really want to hear we heard on monday from connell about his route into to promoting everybody's route is different but there are some things that uh, definitely seem to be patterns so connell's route in you can watch his session again was that he was young he was naive he wanted to book robert plant from led zeppelin so he basically stalked him for about six weeks and made it happen and that was his first show um, and then he started putting on gigs in his uh, local area in hereford and went on to uh, become a promoter. Uh, Maz and Clements have different journeys, but some of them I think will resonate with you. And I want to just start, I'll say hello to you both first. Say hi. Hey, John. Hi. How you doing? Otherwise they're just sitting there. But um, I'll come to them both and just, I want to hear first about their journey in and hopefully that'll resonate with you. So uh, who looks most ready? Clements, let's go with Clements in Lisbon. So Clements runs Bird on the Wire. So. Do you like to introduce yourself, actually, for the people who don't know you? And then just tell us a little bit about how you got into doing your first shows. Sure. Um, so I'm Clemence and I run Bed on the Wire with uh, Tim Falmer, um, who's a really good friend of mine. And that's actually how that's actually how it all started, because we actually met at a show at a venue called Barden's Boudoir in uh, Stoke Newington back when I had just moved in London and he had two. Uh, it was only a few weeks into our both moving into London and I didn't know anyone and I went to see this band uh, called Islands who were a spin-off of a band called The Unicorns that I was a big fan of at the time. And I went to the show on my own and some guy asked me for a cigarette, which if you know Tim is, is, is quite, uh, it's quite a common occurrence for them. And, um, and yeah, and we just became friends and started going to shows together. And over the years, just like 
played with ideas of doing things together, like maybe opening a shop or a record shop or, or putting on some shows. Um, and the funny thing is that Bardon's Boudoir came back into our story because um, Tim started helping the owner there to book some shows in there. And the owner, and that was like maybe a few months that he was helping him, and the owner asked him to organize a three-day event for Easter. Um, so like three nights in the venue, which was, which was a basement and which, was, um, which happened over a sunny Easter weekend. So it was a bit of a, it was a, bit of a difficult task that we got handed there. Um, but yeah, and so Tim called me and was like, do you want to do this together? Uh, let's just like try to book a, put a lineup together for this. And um, we did, and we just got, we just found a name, um, which was probably the most difficult part, to be honest, at the time. We just went through a lot of, uh, of our favorite bands and artists' songs, and we landed on Bad on the Wire, which is a Leon Alcorn song. Um, and I, I still like it, which I guess is good because, because I think over the years you can actually get bored of a name, can't you? Anyway, so we got a name, uh, we got our friend to put a website together, another friend to put a logo together, and uh, off we went with a, a three-day, you know, festival in Barden's Boudoir. Um, I think the only band that we booked that's still around is Django Django, and they were actually opening one of the nights, so they were like the first, first band. Um, most bands otherwise are not around anymore. Um, that's, yeah, that's how we started. And then, um, and then the second show we did was at St. Giles Church in, uh, in Soho. That was a few months after, and it was a particularly interesting one because we had no idea how to promote a show besides those three nights that we'd done in Bardens. And for this one, we had to bring in all the lights, all the PA, and have like stewards bringing people in and all of that. Um, so basically we just got together, I think 10 or 15 friends to do it with us. And, um, and it went really well. It was sold out in advance, which helps when you're really scared to lose money. And, um, and yeah, and it was a really great night. Um, we just thought we'd made it to be honest after that. So yeah. Oh, that's great. And it'll, it, it feeds in, we'll come to Maz's story a little bit. So obviously with Tim, you've met someone, you've got, you're getting on with them, you've got a common interest in music and you're bouncing ideas around about things you might do. So the, the concert is that you're already, you're already on a path. So between doing the first event and the next event, it seems like you'd already thought we'll do something together. And then when presented with the opportunity, did you think much once you've done that first event, oh, this is what we're going to do? Or was it that you'd already had those conversations and off you went or? No, one thing that really resonated with, with what Connell was saying is that it was in terms of having a business plan or anything like this, no, we didn't see further than the next six months really. Um, we booked that show in St. Giles. I can't remember how it came about. Basically, Tim at the time was still helping Barden's Boudoir. And so some bands were getting in touch through that. Um, so our first few shows besides that one were all in Barden's. And, um, and actually I remember going to, so this was in April because it was Easter and I remember going to Primavera in May and um, seeing this artist called The Tallest Man on Earth on stage and just being completely blown away by him. Um, and coming back from that trip, we just tried to book him and we, we managed. So we booked him into Barden's Boudoir again. We did like probably in the first year, we did maybe like 10 shows, I don't know, not even that. And most of them were in Barden's. Um, and um, and th this was like a really big chance meeting with him because then we went on along with him and uh, he started growing. And so we started growing with him literally. But yeah, no, there was absolutely no planning or we just wanted to put on some shows and be out and listen to music. I think. Great. And Maz, I mean, that sounds, there's some similarities that you're knocking around with some friends and you start sort of falling into all of this. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, I never really thought a career in music was a thing that was even possible. I studied French and business at university. Uh, I was in various bands growing up at university from sort of gypsy folk outfits to post rock instrumental white noise bands. Um, 
And at the same time, my mates who are in a band, they're actually getting paid to do gigs. Like they're actually pretty good. Um, so I started tour managing them. They were called Mumford and Sons. Um, and I also uh, tour managed a bunch of other bands, including Sherborg, who are now Bears Den, uh, Daughter, The Staves. Uh, and I was driving these bands around, you know, kind of in and out festivals uh, and across the world, actually. I did some American European touring and obviously absolutely loved it. Um, and started a night at a venue called The Bedford in Ballum. Um, I was booking acts like Michael Kiwanuka and Matt Corby. And I realized pretty quickly that I wanted to be in this industry. Um, I just had no idea what to do. Um, and Ben, who was in Mumford and Sons and Kev, who was in Cherbourg, um, had set up a night in Notting Hill called Communion in 2006, which took place on a Sunday night, hence the name Communion. Um, and um, it was only ever meant to be a club night. Um, but Kev called me one day and said, look, we're thinking about starting a label. Do you want to sort of help? And I was like, yeah, sure. I have no idea what I'm doing. And that was about 11 years ago. Um, our first release was the communion compilation. Um, we'd fill a trolley that we got from the local Sainsbury's with records that we'd sold, uh, take them down to Camden High Street to the post office. And we were selling these records in Japan, New Zealand, America. Um, we had no idea what to charge post and posters and packaging at. Um, so we went for like two pound fifty, I think, because we thought it was a good number. Um, but all of these records cost about nine quids, kind of sending them internationally. So it was a real bittersweet moment every time we made a sort of international sale. Um, and then over time, we put out records by people like Michael Kiwanuka, Ben Howard, Catfish and the Bottle Men, and we forged great relationships with all of these artists. And my role basically quickly developed as a live guy. I was like, let's put on their gigs. They want us to put on their gigs. Can't be that hard. Uh, and our first ever show was 10 years ago at the Lexington with Matthew and the Atlas. Um, I had no idea how to do a deal, you know, didn't know what a versus deal or a plus deal was, but our relationship with the artists and sort of managers was so good that it didn't really matter. Um, I think that's one thing that I've learned over the past 10 years. It's all about relationships. You know, you could do the best job in the world and sort of get sat from working with a band because you don't have the relationships with the agent or the manager and vice versa, you can make a total cock up on a show or a tour, but get away with it because you've got such a strong bond with the band and the manager. Um, so we were getting going. Um, we were probably putting on, as Clement said, like a show a month. And I was like, this is awesome, uh, but couldn't really finance anything. Um, and I looked to an old independent promoter for advice uh, when I was starting out. His name is David Messer. Um, the joke in the communion office is that he sold, he promoted Shakespeare's first show. Um, and um, he saw that we were building a brand um, and he told us to stay fiercely independent. Um, we had a lot of major sniffers, sniffing around, major promoters asking us to do deals with them. And to this day, Community Presents remains independent without a penny of external investment. We sell tickets, we pay artists, and we pay our staff, and that's kind of how we operate. I then grew the team after about two years uh, by hiring our ticketing and production manager, Carly Rocket. Um, I hated doing ticketing outs. Like I hated ticketing um, and putting shows up on sale. I used to scribble down allocations on pieces of paper, which I would then lose. Um, Carly was an absolute star. I couldn't really have built the company without her help. And our staff make up the DNA at Communion. They're all so brilliant at what they do. Um, there's now six of us, Beth, our marketing manager, Emily, who's a live assistant, uh, Jack, who programs Omira and Lafayette, which Communion retained the musical booking contract for. And then last year, I hired Carlos Garampi, who's one of my best mates from Kilimanjaro, as a national promoter, uh, as we sort of grow out of London and sort of increase show volume. And we're now putting on around sort of 250 to 300 shows across the UK. We've got really good systems in place now. Um, and the success of what we do is all about the quality of the artists that we work with and the quality, quality of the work that we produce. Um, there have been lots of highs um, and lows and lots of learnings, which I'm sure we can get into over the next hour or so. Yeah, without doubt. And there's uh, lots of interesting things there, like that, um, you know, you're, you're in and around friends. You don't really know what you're doing, but you're just sort of along for the ride and learning. And but also for both of you, there's a growth. So whoever you're with, so you're with Mumford and Sons when nobody's interested in them, you know, and or putting on Michael Kinuaka when nobody, you know, or Matt Corby. Um, and that's kind of quite a good space sometimes because you can make lots of mistakes. Nobody's really noticing. And if they're 
star ascends, you can be part of that journey. And Clemence hit upon that as well with, with working with, you know, you have a different relationship with acts because you're just a promoter. And I say just a promoter, you promote. Um, but you also been going on that journey with the artists too, right? And it seems that for both of you, um, that's been, there's, there's some similarities to, to explore. And, uh, you know, you can respond to the things that you think are particularly important. But Maz, you've just said this, Connell said this on Monday, and it's evident to me, Clemence in Bird on the Wire's work, that you work with acts that you really love, right? And there's a real focus and a drive. Um, and Connell does that as well. You know, even though he has a very broader repertoire in terms of genre, he's like, I work with these acts that I love and the people that I love. Um, do you think those things are... Um, and we didn't know that as we picked you as as guests, but there's a there's a theme. Do you think that is it really? Do you think that's important to you as promoters uh, in terms of the work that you do, your success, your mental health, your your love of it? Is that something that you respond to? Yeah, I think it's I think it's really important. I mean, for for me, obviously, promoting a show it's it's a lot of. Um, email admin and and all of that stuff and the, the greatest moment of it is when you're actually watching the show happen right and so if in that moment not only can you see all the results of your work but also you're just super happy to watch a band that you love then then that's just yeah that's what even even in the hard times, even when you think, oh my God, this is, I mean, especially being an independent, it can be really difficult sometimes for various reasons that we'll get into. But those moments when you actually watch a band that you love and you actually made it happen, that still gives me the chill every time. I just, yeah. It's, um, yeah, I agree. I think there's also um, the power of saying no. We say no to a lot of people who want to work with community and different bands and agents and managers. Um, because, uh, like Bird on the Wire, we only work with music that we love, um, and that we're passionate about. Um, you know, I'm going to work 50% harder for a band that I listen to all the time versus a band that I don't know anything about. Um, and I agree with, with Connell's point that we can't promote acts that we don't like because you know, it just doesn't make sense. Um, but I think, you know, have that sort of, um, you know, be able to say no to stuff that you don't like. If you've got a good relationship with a with an agent and they're sending you a band and you say, I just don't like this. Most of the time they'll respect you for it um, because they actually sort of trust you and you're building that trust. Don't feel like you need to take stuff on unless you're trying to establish a relationship with an agent that you've not done anything with. Um, don't feel you just need to take stuff on because you take it on, you don't like it, you don't work as hard, you don't sell the tickets, you lose money, no one's winning. Yeah. yeah. I would even say that some agents, when you, when you get that really good relationship with them, some agents actually end up sending you artists that are thinking about signing just to get your opinion on the music and see how... Um, whether you'd be into going for it because uh, you, you build that relationship of trust that's really, that goes as far as A&R as well. So, so that's really, really good as well. Yeah, one of the things that we've heard anecdotally through the Association of Independent Promoters is a few stories like that. So we've heard stories of promoters, mm. you know, well, they start off as just music fans booking bands that they like. And when they've gone back to it, an agent has offered something and they said, well, no, I don't like it. They've been shocked when the agent says, well, people don't normally say that, right? They just take them. Um, and actually also there's a loss of respect for some independent promoters who will listen to the artists they're being sent and give a re reaction because there are other promoters um, that just don't do that, that, that just are book, 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 you know, and don't have that passion. So unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, within, that, within this Bastard class, we haven't picked any of those promoters out, but that was by chance. But it'd be interesting to see across the people watching whether people just book stuff they like and work with people they like. We'll come to that now. Or whether they are sort of just open and will stock anything. You talked about relationships. Connell spoke a lot about relationships. Um, I want to, and Maz, you just mentioned that too. I want to talk, how much of this do you think is, is, is a relationship business? Um, 
I would say maybe sort of 85% personally. Um, going back to Connell's point, um, I also always make sure that everyone in our team does their work on the phone if possible. Um, if there's an issue, I'm like, jump on the phone, speak to the agent, build that relationship. It's not just the promoters who do that. I'll get Beth, our marketing manager, or Carly, our head of production, calling the agent. Um, they're so good at their jobs uh, that I can trust that they can execute that call better than I can. Um, it also improves the relationship with other members of the team um, so that when they're at the gig, the agent knows it's not just me at the show, it's the whole team. Um, and um, I now, you know, when I started, I didn't really know any agents or any managers, but I'd say like there are some managing agents who are now my best friends. And we, you know, I, I, I will try and do a lunch with a week, a lunch a week with an agent. Um, agents love sort of having free lunches or dinners. If anyone is out there sort of watching on the agent side, um, I'll take you out. All good. Um, but yeah, it is all about relationship. The whole music industry is relationship based. And I think lots of industries are, and it's not, it's not necessarily a bad thing, you know. I think it's a really great thing. We work in an amazing industry, and you you you'll, you'll create some incredible relationships with bands and managers and, and agents. Um, but then again, you know, like there are there are agents who I have no relationship with, really, um, who are big clients of mine because um, you know they might be a lot a lot older, uh, and the artist has chosen to work with us. And you know, you try to build that relationship, and you just constantly got to work at it but just because you know i might not be getting on on the phone with um you know one of the older agents and you know talking about our personal life it doesn't mean that we've got you know a, a good working relationship um i'd say you just have to be really really passionate and good about what you're doing and, and, and keeping those lines of communication constantly open um and trying to build all of those relationships where you can because yes i think the success of what you do does hinge on the relationships that you have. Claire Mance, what do you think about the, re the relationship element of the business, of the work we do? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think with us, it was, it was pretty early on a, a conscious decision to really try to work with people that we have a good relationship with, a, a, re a relationship that's based on respect and, and, um, and, trust and loyalty and obviously all these things you just build over the years but um there's some people that you're well i had a couple of friends who became agents and so obviously that made things easy and otherwise there are people that i make friends over the years as they were agents and i guess in the first years you just try to work with with everyone because you just obviously there's a lot of great bands out there that you try to, to promote um, and then you get in a couple of situations where the relationship is not very comfortable and it actually makes the whole experience of booking the show not as enjoyable at all um, because then you get you, you just feel like you've been a little bit bullied or a little bit pushed into something or, or, or that kind of thing and we just try to stay away from this we've been lucky to have a few great relationships that have been so loyal that we've kind of really built our roster um, with them. So like people like Belmont Bookings or ATC at the moment, uh, we work a lot with these guys. And yeah, I just, it, I think, you know, it's, it's really a personal thing for me. It just made me feel bad when I was not having a good relationship with an agent and I just didn't enjoy working on the show. So, it was as simple as that, really. Yeah, what I would say is it just takes one agent for you to get in with, right? To get that relationship with, who might have a big roster, to trust you to suddenly start building your roster. Don't be overwhelmed that, you know, you might not have a relationship at Primary or Paradigm or, or CAA or ATC or whatever. Just find one agent. That's what happened with me in Communion. There was this one agent who really trusted us, who's now my biggest client, and I work with, I'd say, 95% of his roster um because he saw the value in what we do and now we've grown out of that so it only takes one agent to sort of take that leap of faith with you for you to then sort of deliver everything or execute all of those amazing shows that you're going to put on for then everyone else to see so don't feel like oh i don't have relationships elsewhere don't worry about that if you've just got one or two like work on those develop those because then you'll flourish 
Yeah, I think you've hit some, you, between you've hit some really good points about those things. There are hundreds of agents out there. And I'm going to come back to this in a little bit, actually, with Clements, because she started to talk about some of the European agents. There are hundreds of agents out there. And, and to reflect on something Maz was saying, they're all different ages and types and personalities and so on. So some of them, loads of them, you just like, if like if you're going on dating, you wouldn't get on with most of them. But there will be some people that you build a brilliant professional relationship with but you don't connect with personally because like Matt said, but there's other people that will become your best friends. Like, because partly you're in an, a, a space music, which is something that's a shared passion. It's not like we're talking about washing machines unless we really loved washing machines. So you've got something that you're going to bond over. You're going to love the music and love the show. So you will find friends out there. And somebody's asked a question in the chat about that professional personal thing. And I think Maz has tackled that quite well in saying that some of the people will be your friends because it will feel normal and other people won't, but you can have a brilliant relationship with them. Um, and also just reflecting, I think, and Maz touched upon this a little bit as well, but it was something that Clements had said before about not everybody's different relationships work for people in different ways. Some people are really good on the phone. Some people are really good on email and that's as promoters. Some people are uh, less people person, but you can find, you will find people in their sector like you that you will connect with in your own way. I want to come to the European agent thing more, more partly because Clemence, um, I understand from, from your perspective, it was that group of people um, that you really connected with that were really integral to everything that you do in terms of the type of brands that you put on, the acts that you put on, but also giving you that support in the way that David Messer gave Maz support. You want to talk a little bit about some of those people? You mentioned Belmont, uh, for example, as being great yeah. help. Um, yeah, I think, I think most, uh, probably the first two or three years, most of our artists were booked by either Belmont Booking, who are based in the Netherlands, uh, Two Par Two, who are in Belgium, uh, Pitch and Smith, who were working with a lot, who are in Sweden. Um, I think these guys, um, maybe when we came along, obviously yeah, I'm French and uh, um, Tim was in a band, and so we both had perspectives on, on hospitality when we started, which were pretty basic, really. We just, we just figured, from my perspective, because, because I knew that in France, and that was something that a lot of my friends who were artists were saying, um, the hospitality was actually always really good and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and Tim, because he experienced it firsthand. So both of us, I think, we really focused on this in the, in the beginning, but not really out of strategy or anything, but just because we thought, okay, well, when you're touring as a band, the obvious thing is that when you arrive in a venue and it's your first show in, in Europe or whatever, um, and you know, you, you, you want to be welcomed by someone who's friendly, you want to have someone help you carry their, your gear, you want to have food and you know, all of these things that make the whole experience a bit less intimidating because a lot of these bands have just really started. And, um, and I think that's something that resonated a lot with, with some of these um, European agents. Um, they got the feedback from the bands that we're working with as well. Um, and you know, I think basically, yeah, we, we build this relationship on a human thing, I think. Not really, like we, we didn't know anything about business or anything. So what we were doing was just things that we thought personally made sense in terms of welcoming people and um, just trying to make sure that everybody had a good, good experience. And that includes the audience as well. And just like trying to like make that whole process of people feeling that they're coming into a show, um, both the band and the audience, like feeling comfortable and like people on the door are friendly and all of these things. Um, so yeah, I think that really connected us with, with, with those, those agents. Also, I think because they were not UK based and so they couldn't really be at the shows most of the time. Oh. So it was important for them to know that someone was actually really, you know, doing the extra step uh, with the with the artists that's a really good reflection as well actually isn't it that yeah they're not on the ground so they're trusting somebody in the uk mm -hmm. to be their guardians and, and you're the people and can i just so one of the things so, so connell in his career we keep re referencing that that's available online but five years in as being a solo promoter he gets offered a job at mcp which doesn't exist anymore but was a bit was one of the big national promoters um, and he worked through as a national promoter, uh, ultimately 
until a few years ago where he now runs his own big national company. Um, but you, Maz, you touched upon it. You know, you, communion is still, you know, 100% independent. And Clements, you and Til, Tim are 100% independent. But um, so you've not made that, that jump. Um, um, but also, I think for you, Clements, there was a particular point in you've been promoting for a few years when some of these acts, your small acts that you're developing are breaking um, and you're, you're going from these smaller shows to the bigger shows. And so I'd like to kind of, what was that like? What is that like? What did you learn? What wouldn't you do again? <laughs> from those moments where you're going from a couple of hundred people to, uh, you know, Roundhouse, Albert Hall. Um, well, it's, it's, um, uh, it's really exciting. That's, that's the main thing, I guess. Um, it's really the, f the first time you actually do, for example, I, I, pr I think a Coco or something like this is, is a, is a real milestone, which is a thousand five hundred five hundred cap. And then the first run house that you do is a real milestone as well. And funnily on the, on the first run house that we did, it was actually with Kings of Convenience who, um, we didn't start working with from the beginnings because uh, obviously they were going since way before we were promoting um, but we actually built a relationship with Erland Oy who's one of the kings of convenience through his other band called White is Boy Alive who we had booked through one of our European agents and uh, it went really well and so when kings of convenience returned and were doing a roundhouse show um, Rob, Rob Chalice, who was um, a coda and still is paradigm now, um, actually gave us the show, which was a real break for us because we actually had never worked with coda at the time, I don't think. And especially being our first round house, we'd never done a round house. Um, and with a band that obviously, you know, was going to sell it out, the, the ticket price was a bit higher than what we usually do. Um, this was 2013, so like three, three years into promoting or something. And that was a big leap of faith from Rob and actually really grateful to him to this day to have given us this, this, this chance because, because really, yeah, we just, didn't really know um, how to run a show this size. And I guess the thing is, as, as, as everything when you're a promoter, I think, it's just you get on board, you just uh, figure it out. I think that's one of the qualities that is probably the most common within all promoters. It's just you tr always try to find a way for things to happen um, in, in the best way. So you just, you know, whatever it is, and you learn, you learn from experiences. And when you get to the bigger shows as well, one thing that's really interesting is that the team of the venue, every, everyone knows exactly what they're doing. Um, so it gets actually a lot more fluid uh, when you get to those bigger shows because, um, because every, you know, there's, there's budget, everyone has a role that's very defined, so you're not stepping on anyone's toes. And the venues are very well oiled uh, at this level. And so they know exactly what, so they actually help you as well. The venues have really helped and taught us along the way. Um, every time that we had a first big show up somewhere. So, so a, a co, a co a, and co-promoting. So the idea that you're working with a bigger, you know, a bigger promoter or a national promoter or another promoter. So that's also seems to be quite a common, that was your step. So you're learning through that process as well. You're sort of half in with somebody else. Yeah, we don't co from We don't do that many co pros actually. We try to right. not because um, you know we just it's it's a it's a strange one when you're when you're an independent promoter and you develop an artist and then and then and then someone um, gets thrown into that relationship. It, it puts a little bit of imbalance. Um, but yeah, of course, we have definitely learned through co-promoting. I mean, for example, our first Brixton Academy we did with the War on Drugs and that was a co-pro with DHP. Um, and, you know, from there on, you feel more comfortable. If anything, it actually makes you feel more comfortable about your ability to, to take it on. So once you've done it with someone, um, you're just like, okay, this is, this is just, 
the same thing, but a bit bigger and we'll handle it. And so then we went on to do our own Brixton's and um, yeah. I think that's really good. I think a lot of that's actually from a lot of other promoters. That's how they feel. They're very nervous about it. And as soon as they're in it, they go, oh yeah, I can do this. Cause they really, they have got the skills. Maz, what was it like for you? You know, you've been on tour with bands playing bigger things, but as your promoter, as a promoter, what did it feel like? Yeah, it was, it, 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 was, it was pretty exciting, also pretty terrifying. Uh, I mean, I remember the first time I got the call to do my first Brixton, then Ali Pali, then O2, um, and the buzz sort of remains the same. Um, I didn't have a huge sort of amount of concern over the sort of running and delivering of the show because the team and the staff, like, I kind of have, I have 100% trust in all of them. Um, and we have great show reps that have done, you know, sort of now stadium level bands. So on the night, I've, I've, I felt really comfortable that we were going to deliver the show. I think the concern for me was not selling the tickets. Because um, when you're at sort of Ali Pali level or you're doing multiple nights at Ali Pali and suddenly you're doing 6,000 out of 10,000 tickets, you could be staring down the barrel of like a sort of two, 300K loss. Um, and that would wipe out any small independent <laughs> promoter. Um, you know, there's, there's the, that, that, those are the concerns really. Um, and I think um, in terms of the, the co-promotion point, um, we co-promote quite a lot of bands. And I think any independent promoter is gonna have to co-promote a band when they're doing their first Brixton, their first Ali Pali, their first O2. Um, and it's going more that way now. Um, because the agents have to have a complete faith in you and also get so much pressure from the national promoters to come on board. Um, and I think for us, um, you know, we, we had to prove ourselves at that bigger level, which we've done now. Um, but, um, you know, there was, there's always chat from the agent or from different promoters being like, you know, you've not done this level of show and you might lose the artist, so you should co-promote it. Um, and um, we do co-promote um, a few things at the moment um, at the slightly larger level. Um, but now we've done that, you know, and as Clement says, you know, we've got that experience. The next pipeline of artists that come through as Communion presents artists, when we get to O2 level in the next couple of years, we can just do those shows by ourselves. Um, I think a uh, word of advice for some of the sort of smaller promoters that are going to get going might have a couple of bands on their roster. If you're concerned that you're going to lose the band, you know, form a relationship with another promoter and co-promote the act because you'll pick up some skills. You'll be able to say in a couple of years to a different agent that I've done a Brixton Academy show. You might have just sat and just watched it all happen you know, and the other promoter might have done everything, but you're still involved and you can still say, I've done a Brixton or I've done an Ali Pali. Um, and no one can question that because you've been part of that. So I think if you're concerned that you might lose something, then, you know, get in there early with a trusted promoter and maybe even like pick up a couple of other markets. Might, you might say that I do the South Coast with this act, but why don't we do the South and the West together? Um, so, um, have those, have those conversations, um, if you feel like, um, you're being pushed to, or you're concerned about losing the act because it's better to have 50% of something than a hundred percent of nothing in my opinion. And, um, you know, once you've got that experience, then you can just do all of the shows by yourself. Um, but I feel like we are sort of moving into a world where co-promote co-promotes are more likely because it appeases the agent and there are lots of different relationships happening. And I think if you can try and get it by yourself, obviously that's, that's what you want to do. Um, but if you're being forced into, into co-promotes, that's normal. That happens a lot. Yeah. And I think it's good to reflect on that and put the hat on for people to, you know, to understand, like maybe if you're in the agent's position, the agent might, the agent might really want to work with you, but is under pressure that perhaps is a very, very big, I won't name names, but promoter, very big promoter who's saying, well, yeah, but have they ever done a Brixton? And, you know, it can't go wrong because then the agent would be responsible for that. So, so that is a trick really that some of the bigger, very big companies would use. Well, they've never done a Brixton and that would be the way that they would get the business because at that level you've developed an act that is now that was not worth tickets and you've been part of a journey and they're now worth money. Right. Um, 
So seeing Bird on the Wire, seeing Communion, seeing those companies come through and deliver at that level really helps the independent sector. And like Maz says, you know, you can actually look across to other independents. So you might be trying to go from your first 200 cap show to your first 500 and the same problem can happen. A bigger promoter might be, oh, I've never done a 500 cap show, but there'll be an independent promoter in that town that you could work with um, who has done it. You say, well, I've, I'll work with, you know, uh, Nathan at the Bruder now, right? Um, be, and he's a trusted person and that's how you build those relationships. So you can co-promote and lots of independent promoters do work like that to help each other build up. Um, so you can all do an alley pally one day, <laughs> I think. Staring down the barrel of a loss. Connell thinks that, um, Connell said, I think that he doesn't, basically he thinks that a sign of a good promoter is that you've probably lost money at some point and come through the other side or it's inevitable. Is it inevitable? Um, have you had those kind of experiences and how did you get through the other side and keep going? Uh, I'll, I'll go first. Um, oh, I hate losing money. It is the single worst thing um, that can happen to you. Um, and to be fair, like we've lost money on, we lose money on shows. It's hard to make money on small shows. Um, and, you know, we take risks, but they're calculated risks. And we've never lost a lot of money to the point where it's like, shit, what are we going to do? And I think that is because we've got real conviction in the artists that we work with and we've got a great team. And they are calculated risks. You know, we're not going to go and put on a massive show with an artist who we don't know anything about uh, and offer a ridiculous guarantee just because we're going to get the show because that's not how we operate. Um, but all promoters lose money and it is the worst thing in the world. Um, and I think when it is your own business or when it's your own thing, it's even harder. But that will make you a better promoter because it will... It just, it's just, I, I guess it's just sort of experience, isn't it? Um, and, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that none of us on this call ever have to like stare down the barrel of a sort of hundred, hundreds of thousands of pounds of, of losses, but it does happen. And I think when that happens, that is because you haven't spent enough time thinking about the show or you've been bullied into it. Um, it's your money um treat it like your money and be really careful about what you're offering and where you're going um and don't be bullied into the into the wrong sort of the wrong sort of offers or guarantees that's what i would say that's really good so you sometimes re you reflect and think actually i made there was an error here i i, I responded and i should have so yeah more confidence to say no more confidence to be more confidence to say no challenge the agent and also like challenge every part of the conversation it's not just Oh yeah, it's a 1500 capacity venue, which feels right. Like, is it in the right part of your city? Uh, is it a standing or a seated venue? What's the audience like? Were they going to like going there? Was the last show in East London? Should you do the same show in East London within six months? Challenge every single point um, and go through it meticulously. There'll be some agents that will want to go through that with you because ultimately if the show doesn't sell, you know, they're the ones that are getting the slack as well. They're still getting paid at the end of the day. You're the one that's getting slack and have lost money. Um, so challenge, constantly challenge, constantly, constantly challenge. So you, you seem to learn from that experience. Clemens, have you been through the, have you had some tough times and, and you're, still, you're still here? Yeah, yeah actually, Actually, we had a we had a, a a first big loss, which was a few thousands. I mean, it was you know it was not it was not huge, but for us, we were at the time only still Tim and me, and maybe we had a one person at the team. It was in the, in the early years, and that was really really difficult for us and really daunting and kind of disheartening and disheartening as well because obviously the, the thing when you're a promoter is that you work really hard and then you might not not just not make money but you might actually lose money and so when you've worked really hard on 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 something it's 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 not even not getting your work paid it's it's actually actually people taking away money that you've you know, made over more successful shows. So the first one that we had was, was a really, the one, first one that I remember, I'm sure that we lost a little bit before this, but um, 
uh, was really difficult. And we actually had to, we actually had to ask uh, our parents to, to lend us a little bit of money, like uh, just 5,000 each, but something to actually kind of keep us, keep our uh, cash reserve going because we still had some shows coming up. And another thing that we found out when this happened as well is that we just tried to speak to all of our partners at the time. Um, and so that's, you know, potentially the artists, but obviously the deals are impossible to renegotiate. But um, the venue and try to see if there's something that you can work around, like, for example, with the venue that, that that happened with, we managed to tell them, okay, well, we're committing to five shows at the venue next year. Um, and, you know, this way you, you cut us some slack on the, on the hire on this one. Um, so that really helped. And, um, and yeah, and the funny thing is that we, we actually were very, very, um, 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 we, we just doubted ourselves at that point. And this was like, yeah, four or five years into, into promoting. And the following year after that was our best year yet of all these years. And suddenly that year we had like five roundhouses when we'd only done one before, but suddenly it was a big break here because a lot of our artists just blew up. And, and that really made up for it. So, so that also made us realize that um, you know, you can have some like tough times, but then it turns around. And as long as you're confident about your artists um, and that they're amazing, they're going to at some point like blow up, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. That's, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the thing. One of the things about independent promoters is they, we, we ran a survey while you were talking about, you know, are you in it for the love of music and do you work with actually love, you know, and that, that, that's the overall feeling, right? And you talk about those acts blowing up, but arguably they blow up because you've been promoting them all, for all those years or been one of the people that's been passionate about them. And if, we're, if we look at the whole ecosystem of music, the very, very big promoters don't promote those acts. Um, you know, they, they work in a very different space. They work with big shows. So it requires somebody there with the bands, being passionate about them, putting them on, put, everybody's losing money, including the band, playing to two people, playing to five people, playing to 10 people, you know, to be there. We see in hard times, those smaller acts are the ones that gets dropped, you know, with the agents or the record labels, you know. So we really require that strength and that sustainability of independent promoters to be there. So a world without communion or bird on the wire, you know, you're not replaceable immediately. You know, it takes a long time. Actually, we should ask you, Maz, you didn't have a... So Clemence reflected on her name. This is just, this isn't helpful for anybody. Well, maybe it is. She said the hardest part was picking her name and she still loves the name. You didn't get to pick the name Communion. I didn't get to pick the name Communion. You still but, love it? Um, I, yeah, I really like it. I mean, it was, it, was the, the, it was called Communion because the idea, there aren't any sort of religious connotations. It was the club night was on a Sunday and it was a coming together of friends, basically. Um, so that's why it was called Communion. Um, then we were associated, because Ben, who was one of the founders, so then we were associated with Mumford and & Sons, and then everyone thought we were a Christian label, um, which, we were, which, we, which we aren't, and no problems against that, but everyone thought that there was like sort of religious connotations. But um, I think the hard thing for us is that we, um, we were born out of this sort of folk scene. Um, and for the first three to four years, um, it was like, we, I was just, and, and still to this day, you know, it's like, hey, I've got the perfect artist for you. And it's someone with their banjo. Uh, and it's, you know, we're not sort of strictly uh, limited to that genre of music. And it was difficult getting out of that because people just thought we were the com communion folky nice guys. Um, then we did sign Catfish and the Bottle Men. Um, and that sort of changed the perception of the brand. Um, you know, and now we work with sort of rock bands like Clear Patrick and uh, Highly Suspect to singer-songwriters, poppy stuff like George Ezra and Lewis Capaldi to your more electronic stuff like Sylvain Esso and Jack Garrett. So um, I still really love the name um, and love the brand. It, it means a lot to me. Um, and I think with the brand thing, you know, if you, if you, all these independent promoters out there, if you're not coming out of the scene, you still have a you can still have a brand, and that brand is like being good at what you do. 
for example, someone like SJM, who I think are really good promoters, they've got a really strong brand, but I don't think that brand is limit. You know, I don't think it's about sort of genres of music that they work with. So I wouldn't be worried about, Oh, I'm, I'm not coming out of a scene or like my friends are in a band or anything like that. If you're really good at what you do and consistently sort of produce amazing events, you will be able to build, build your own brand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different type of band, isn't it? FCM have a reputation as a solid, they're in yeah. an, in an independent promoter as well, but a, yeah. you know, a massive, solid, reliable, independent promoter because obviously out there, there's lots of people who are very unreliable, but none of them are members of the association of independent promoters. Uh, we've got lots of questions coming in, which we're going to come to in about 10 minutes. I want to talk to you about some of the, Maz, you were very, you were very pleased to get rid of ticketing from your, from your workflow. Um, but generally, um, we will come and talk about COVID as well, but sort of ignoring that for a bit. Within the live sector, you've arrived, uh, you've been working in it for a decade, both of you for a decade, uh, just over a decade. What kind of things do you see are changing um, or that are good or that could change that, are, that would be good? Uh, or, or things that you've seen that have disappeared that you're glad that those changes have happened? Are there um particular like work working things um methods mm. um, schedules deadlines i would say um obviously the push online and it's it's definitely easier promoting shows um with uh all of the online tools that we have um as connor said you know back in the day it was just a sort of fax machine and now we you know we've got you know targeted ads and um i think one thing is, is, is print ads. You know, we all, we all push to run print ads, spending thousands of pounds in something like Time Out, uh, but we don't know if anyone reads it um, and whether that's going to go away. Um, it feels like print publication is, is slowly disappearing. So whether that goes away and everything sort of remains online, it, I guess it depends on the demographic of the band that you're trying to market. I think ticketing for me has been a really difficult uh, sort of, part of the industry to navigate over the past 10 years because um, it's so murky. Um, the roots are deep. You don't know, uh, you just don't know like all of these different charges that are on tickets and whether they're needed. And now sort of post COVID is everything going to go into e-tickets? Does that mean booking fees are going to reduce because we won't need any hard tickets? Um, we're slowly getting away out of secondary which is obviously a very good thing um so the ticketing thing i think has been has, has been difficult and there has been an amazing push from the fanfare alliance to sort of get rid of, of secondary and it feels like we're getting there um so i think for me ticketing has been a big thing um and it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next year or two in terms of it going fully sort of electronic in my opinion yeah, and that's a good pickup from Connell. When Connell, again, reflected, when he started, there was like one ticketing company. And, uh, uh, and now you have not only a, a plethora of ticketing companies, but you also have different formats, as you're touching upon. Clemence, uh, you know, are the particular things for you, Clemence, that you see changing that you are excited about or um, would yeah. like to see happen? Listening to Connor, like it was actually interesting. It actually made me feel like the move to online has actually made things a lot more complicated than they used to be, rather than simplifying. Um, obviously, ticketing has become something huge, which which even when we started it wasn't like this. We would just like put on. We had like three outlets. We would put on some tickets, and that was it. Now you just have to think about. Um, strategies of ticketing or kind of yeah who you're working with and all of that stuff it's 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 gone it's gotten really complicated um but yeah i mean the the, the online for me for me the focus on online advertising is is a two-way um is a two-way thing because as much as i like the organic uh, possibilities that open to reach people that actually are interested in what you're doing and everything um, that's kind of almost a fantasy nowadays I think I think everything has to be paid ads and I just see most of our marketing budget going into um, 
uh, Facebook, Google mainly, and that doesn't make me feel very comfortable. Um, so I'm, I'm not actually, I, I still quite like buying ads in, in, in print, uh, although that might make me really old fashioned. Um, or I, I wish there was alternatives online to advertise, which were not just all going to the same pot of people um, who, you know, that's another conversation. But anyway, um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of, of um, I, I wish that there was a bit less admin and ticketing and all of these things. And I feel like over the years, or maybe, I, I never really know if it's because we've been growing over the years. And so obviously this, as you do more bigger shows, then this is the kind of thing that happens. Or, or if it, everything has just become a bit more, um, a bit more long-winded. Um, but in terms of, of things that I would like to see uh, in the future, um, there's, there's, there's two things that I, I think are really important to me is uh, one of them, which would be more kind of um, more fluid relationships with all people who are involved within, within the concert and with, and with the artists. So like the agent, management, artists, that we can all have conversations that are less kind of... Um, um, segregated even because there's, a, there's, there's this tendency as a promoter that you can only speak to the agents and you know you can't actually communicate as a group and try to come up with solutions as a group so that also the artist and the manager know how much you you know put into all of this um, and then there's this sustainability which I think which I think is something that we're working on um, at the moment and just trying to find ways of um, of, of making, you know, tours more um, sustainable, green touring in general, just like, you know, like things like the rider and how we can make, facilitate all of this, which I think at the end of the day will not only reduce waste, but also reduce costs um, if everyone knows what they exactly need. And mm. so that also again comes with more communication with, uh, with the artist and the management, I think. I, I also, can I just jump in quickly? I think insurance yeah. is a big thing that we've all sort of had issues with over the past few months. I mean, we all, as independent promoters, always promoters spend hundreds of thousands of pounds a year with insurers for them to have just turned around and be like, I'm sorry, there's a blanket exclusion on, on, on COVID-19, um, which has really uh, affected um, how promoters might be able to operate moving forward or even affected whether they're going to survive. Um, so I think more clarity um, and support from insurance, uh, from the insurers, um, when there is something that should 100% be covered um, and we should be supported, that, that is, there's just been a blanket exclusion, which I think is, which I, which I think is unacceptable. Yeah, definitely. It's a big, it's a big problem. I think that, um, Clemens, just to touch upon what you were saying, is that there's definitely, it feels like we're in a, changing time whether that's covid or it but covid has definitely accelerated some things i think and what you're talking about reflects on a webinar i was involved in with independence day i think it was yesterday that the idea basically there, there needs to be more conversations between all those people what you're saying conversations in the ecosystem about a show and it was it's evident that perhaps unfair on connell but back in that day you know the agent's worth was the agent had a black book of the best people in each town there actually wasn't that many people in each town and that was a secret you know and the person the promoter in each town knew how to promote in that area and there was a like quite a linear segregated relationship between the, that doesn't exist anymore you know we're all on a zoom now um the promoter is actually you know knows the area really well but actually is also increasingly like Maz said using artist data to help sell the show the artist is much more involved um, promoters aren't secret anymore. We can find all, each, each other. The agent's black book has gone really because it's evident who the really good promoters are around the UK. But where the strength is for the agent, manager, artist is to be in a room talking all the time about how to make the most of the show. And Clement said something in, in a conversation we had before, which I thought was great, is promoters are here to help make artists money, you know, to develop artists, bring them audiences and ultimately to make them money. So why aren't all the other people in, that are involved in that having these kind of conversations to make the best shows. Um, I think COVID's accelerated the use of Zoom, which will be the tool in which we do it. Um, I just want to talk a, 
another thing just about COVID before we come into a lot of the questions, but just to kind of see personally, like as you and as communion or as bird on the wire, how has COVID affected you as companies, as promoters? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's had a massive effect on, on, on us and me and I think everyone. I mean, um, when this started in March, um, you know, we rescheduled everything to, as, as Connell, exactly as Connell said, like to sort of post summer, we thought everything was going to come back then. And now everything's sort of moved into next year. Um, we, as a company, we, uh, in March were like, we can get through this. We've got enough money in the bank. We had a good year last year, uh, until shows come back at the end of the year. And then we quickly realized, uh, that actually, um, this was going to go into next year. So we um, made a decision to, from early on, that we were going to retain all of our staff uh, and uh, have apl applied for a loan and communion's just going to go into debt until we get out of this and sort of support our staff. Um, so that obviously has its own effect on the business, but also our staff who are furloughed, who... Uh, are used to getting up at nine in the morning or eight in the morning, getting to the office, doing a full day's worth of work, getting through a couple of hundred emails, going to a show every night to suddenly down tools, not know what's happening to, to their industry has a massive effect on their mental health and their mental well-being. Um, and, you know, you feel responsible for all those people um, and want to make sure that they're okay. And hard to reassure them when you don't know what's going to happen. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think everyone is, everyone's in the same boat um, in, 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 in that regard. Um, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's, it's, it's been pretty difficult, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we are all in the same, in the same situation, as you, as you say. Um, it's, you know, that, that, that there is a bit of support. So for, for our team, um, the, they are on furlough, so obviously that that helps. Um, we're gonna have to see if we can get any more funding from the recent um, big pot of money that the government has announced. But I think really it's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna be about when we can return because I, I just I just don't see how long we can be supported anyway. Um, even if if the government was decided to, su to supporting to support the, um, the live industry uh, more than it already has. But for how long? Because, yeah, it's, it's the, 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 the lack of clarity, the lack of... It's, it's a funny one because it's a job being a promoter. You always plan ahead, right? You're always like, okay, so in three months we'll do this, six months we'll have this show and da, da, da. And not having that clarity at all and just not knowing even what next week is going to be like is a is a is a new new um new feeling to deal with <laughs> mm. well i mean so yeah there is government there is the culture recover the, the government support that they've allocated for all of culture and arts is 1.57 billion in england um 53 million in wales i don't know the amount for scotland um Northern Ireland, you know, but for example, in England, um, you know, all of that will go through the Cultural Recovery Fund, which the Arts Council administering, which opens next week. And at AIP, we're going to run some workshops to help people to apply and promoters will be eligible, but it's competitive, you know, so there's no guarantee that you will get it. And I think like you're saying, both saying also, it runs until March next year. And at the moment, we still don't know whether that will be long enough. Um, so I'm going to move into some questions. Um, and actually, the first one follows on from that. So the, one of the things that the government on top of that has said is there's going to be a, a reduction in VAT, a VAT, which has started and went on ticket sales until, until January. Um, the question is, do you think that promoters should pass this saving on to the fan to help with audiences return? I mean, basically, the question is, what should, what should happen to that money? So there would be a 15% saving. Some people think, oh, it should be therefore passed on to the audience. Some people think, well, actually, it's for the promoter to try and cover the loss of income, at, you know, zero income and the debts. Some people think it should be used for innovative marketing. Have you got a view on how? Or, some people said, well, there's no point. We're not going to be selling any tickets. 
what's your view on the on the VAT? We don't um, I yeah, it's it's a difficult one. We haven't actually really made a final call on this because, as you say, we're not selling tickets at the moment anyway, and. Um, this is, I guess, not a decision that we're really going to have to make until we we um, we settle the shows. Um, there's, I mean, for the shows that are not on sale yet, there is an argument to try to reduce the ticket price and 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 obviously make it easier for people to come back to shows. Um, I do feel that probably, it, I, you know, it, this is made to support the 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 live industry and in a way um in a way i i've yeah actually i'm sorry i'm i'm confused about this subject i don't have a, a set i don't have i'm it's still confusing. playing with it in my head even so it's really yeah. difficult to because obviously the artists need it the agents need it we need it the audience needs it you know like everyone needs it no one is making money at the moment so what is a fair split of that money? I just still haven't come to that conclusion. Um, yeah, it's it's super confusing. I, I agree. And I think, I mean, my stance on it is that I think the, the VAT reduction is there to aid businesses get through this sort of difficult time and maybe cover some of the losses that they've had to, you know, they've had, they've had to swallow. Um, and I think the... The conversations will be done on a case by case basis on the show that you're doing. I think for me, um, we would keep ticket prices the same because I, I, I think the the small VAT reduction isn't going to massively change the ticket price on the sort of level of show that we're doing. Um, but if you can if you can filter all of that money down through the chain through promoter, agent, manager, artist, um, then that might be the best thing to do. Um, but I do think it will be done on a case by case basis. Um, but it, it, it's another sort of challenging, uh, tricky ticketing um, scenario that we find ourselves in. Um, yeah, and it's well, important well, to recognise that, like the VAT, the VAT, that, that's what they've announced at the moment. But but the live sector as a whole, ourselves included, are asking for that VAT reduction to continue for three years. Yeah. You know? One thing I would just. Uh, one, one thing I would just mention that I think I'm, I'm pretty sure is that I, I wouldn't really think fair for it to be going into the settlement on the kind of ratios that the settlements are based on, which is 80% uh, to the artist and agent um, by, that, by that way, and, and 20% to the, to the promoter or even 85 and 15. Um, I think there must be a fairer split than that. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's, I think, that will have to be discussed um, on a case by case, or hopefully we can come to a common position with the AIP. You know. Yeah, that's <laughs> a, that, and that's a really good. Yeah, I think that's that articulates what a lot of promoters feel is that every I think you, between you captured it. Everybody needs it, and but we have to look at like who needs it as a priority or how it's fair. There's a question here which I'm going to sort of give you in two because I'm actually going to expand the question. The particular question is about. Uh, when you're working with acts that don't have an agent and then they get an agent um, and particularly thinking about what it's like when you were, when you were first starting out, um, is that the, how, you know, is that the way that you begin to build relationships or how do you do it? But I also am aware that you can be established as a promoter and an act will move agency or agent. Um, and how do you manage that? How do you, do you have to wave your hands in the air or do you get taken? Have you had that experience? Has it always been good or bad? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, that moment when an artist changes an agent is always a bit, uh, 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 is a moment where suddenly you're not sure where you're standing so much. Um, so it will really depend on the relationship that you have with the new agent, uh, obviously with the, on the relationship that you have with the artist and their management. And if they change their management at the same time, which usually when there's a change of agent, it, it comes from that as well, then you're really starting everything. You might be starting everything from scratch. Um, yeah, it's obviously happened. And in these kind of situations, we have lost artists in the past, um, having moved to agents that we didn't have a relationship with at all. Um, it's happened in other cases that the new agent kept us on board. Um, a lot of the times through the artist request, I think, because they've just been really happy with what we do. And I guess 
then it turns into a GoPro. That's that's the kind of situations when when usually it will turn into a GoPro because the agent will want to bring in another promoter. Uh, the artist will still want us on board, and at the end of the day, for the artist, it doesn't make a difference in terms of the settlement and the money that they get. So, you know, in that in that way, everybody still stays um, stays on the on the on the project. Um, and then when you start working with an artist that doesn't have an agent, and then they do get an agent. Uh, again, I think it's a similar situation. It's really, do you already have a relationship with that person and um, with that agent? Do you already have a relationship with the band and how is that going to articulate? So these are moments where you need to pick up the phone or you know write a good email or uh, just kind of get your thoughts together and and figure out a way to uh, to to stay to stay. Uh, Stay on board. Yeah, totally. Get in front of them. Just try and do whatever you can to get in front of them. Um, yeah, try and get a lunch in and build that relationship. Um, you like a lunch, don't you, Maz? Yeah. I love a lunch. Be here. I love a lunch. Um, you, don't need, you don't need to take me for out for lunch. You can do without that. That's fine. <laughs> um if you like lunch as much as me take them out for lunch uh I'll, 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 yeah i would just try and get in front of them really and lobby to the band and to the to the manager and be like look i re you know i really really want to keep working with you um you know tr try and get them to have the conversation with the agent and i think one thing to realize um is that you know if you're a promoter out there and you've lost a band or you're you're about to lose a band like it happens to everyone like everyone loses acts and whether that's you're a promoter or you're an agent or you're a manager, people always move around. And I think when it happens to you, it's so shit. Um, especially if it's a big band that you've been working with for ages and you know there's, there wasn't much reason for them to leave you, but be aware that it happens to everyone and it's just an experience and um, you know, try and see the positive around it if it happens. It, will, it, will, it won't feel positive. It's always really shit, but um, you know, it, just be like, just be aware that it happens uh, to a lot of people. And it does happen to the bigger promoters as well. It happens in both ways. So yeah. when, when that's the case, uh, it, it's really comforting. Yeah, I remember being in a big promoter's office and, and they would just lost Katy Perry. And it was weird when you're in a world where they're, they're you know, and I just lost Catfish in the Bottom and whatever. And it was like, oh, right, okay. Um, there's another interesting question. I never, can, I never really thought about it. We, we all work with... Uh, oh, yeah, we've asked the poll question. Would you like lunch with Maz? Uh, so onion sandwich. I mean, come on. I mean, no um, one for that, are they? I'd rather have lunch with Clemens. Um, it's not they say that he'll take you up on it, but there you go. Um, I'll pay. You'll pay. I'll pay. Oh, I always pay. I always yeah, pay. Yeah, that's I pay. So. Got to use that bounce back loan on something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. If you're going to go under, go under in style. There's a good question about relationships with venues, um, which I never reflect on before. Like we all love venues. We use loads of them. Um, but yeah, how? Yeah, how important is your relationship with a venue? Um, Clemence, you were talking before about how when you were struggling in that time, actually it was about talking to the venue. Um, People might not consider that as they build up um, the relationships they're going to, you know, in their town or place. Yeah, I think that's a really important. Uh, that's the really important part of it as well. Is um, yeah, essentially every, everyone that you work with through through um, putting a show together, you you build relationships with, and and um, you want to try to um, discuss any conditions that might feel a little bit difficult for you to make the show happen. Um, a lot of venues, when they want a show, they'll be happily discussing, you know, the higher rate or, or other things that they can do to help and support, like marketing and things like this. So if you don't really have that many resources, um, venues who are a bit more established might, and, and the small ones as well, any size of venues might really, might really help um, with the show, yeah. There's a, yeah, I mean, experience from working in venues, what they say is they like good independent promoters because although they can't guarantee the show will be sold out, they know they'll get the work done. Yeah. Whereas if they have a bad promoter, um, they have to do a lot of hand-holding, answering questions and so on. So they, there is a really great relationship, which I'd never thought of really. Just, it just happens, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I would say it's really important to build those relationships. I would say um, most of those bigger venues from Shepherd's Bush to Ali Pali uh, 
I have given the venue manager like a six pound bottle of wine and then got like 500 quid off the hire. If the show is struggling, it's mad. Like just doing small things like that can open a few doors. Um, and oh, I think I won the cheese sandwich. Oh, I'm paying though. <laughs> um, and ultimately, yeah, building relationships with those guys is so important. As Clement said, like they'll help market your shows more. Um, again, it's a relationship thing. Like the better, the better your relationships with uh, across the board, I think, you know, the more successful generally you will be. That's my take on it anyway. Um, says if you were to start promoting now, so this is a good question, would you set up your own company as you have done or would you join an existing promoter company? That's quite reflective. Learning, learning all that you've learned than what you've done. I wouldn't, be a, I wouldn't be a promoter. No, I'm joking. I'm obviously joking. <laughs> um, do you want to go first, come on, or should I answer? Yeah, I, I feel like it's, it, it's, it's really difficult out there at the moment like to try to build a new, um, a, a new, a new brand and a new, yeah, um, there's, there's a lot of people. I mean, the thing is, we, we promote in London mainly, so it's, it's difficult to, to speak for further than this. Um, in London, it feels very saturated, but I'm sure there's always, there's always space for someone who's got really good ideas and who's going to be, um, you know, just uh, creative with the music that they promote and with how they do it as well. So I don't know. I think it's, I, I think it's really a matter of, of how, you know, if there's a, if there's a company out there that represents, um, what you what you want to do as a promoter then um try to go for it is if there's none then it means that um you know you'll have an audience following you because the, if if you don't have anyone that represents you then then it means that uh, other people don't so so i think it's really a matter of how of how you want to be um um bringing shows to life i think it's two different two different jobs and I, i've never actually worked for a promoter so i don't really know what it means um yeah i th i think it depends on what you're trying to achieve like if you want to if you're starting out and you want to learn as much as possible and you think the best way of doing that is by going to a big promotions company and picking up all of these different sort of tools then go and do that because in the long run then you could go and set up your own thing like connell's done or if you've had five six years of experience and you've got the relationships and you're at a different company where you're like, I want to give it my own shot. And you've got aspirations of running your own company and, you know, you know being involved in sort of all of the sort of micro decisions around a business, then, then great, go and set it up. Um, I think it, yeah, it depends on, on, on what you're trying to do. If you can find a gap in the market in a certain city, as Clement said, like, you know, and, and you see that there's an opportunity there, then, then, then go for it. It just totally depends on what's right for you. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we ran a poll of who's here and just under half the people here are established concert promoters. There's a big chunk of people who are starting out and then some people looking and then there's just some other people who are who are looking for a free lunch or just along for fun. But I think across the two panels, we've we've really covered that, um, you know, if you are happen to be starting, you, I think, through what you said today, given people confidence that they could probably do it all themselves, right? That they could go through that co-promotion experience, doing the bigger shows and go, yeah, I've got the skills. Um, and if we reflect also on Connell, it was really interesting that lots of the young agents that he met knocking around in companies are now running, like Charlie Meyer is now running one of the big agencies, 13. Uh, Stuart, who made him his first promoter friend, who made him a cup of tea at MCP, runs Kilimanjaro, one of the you know, the bigger, medium sized promoters in the UK, national promoters. So, you know, people will go on their own journeys through it. But I think um, for both of your companies, one of the questions is, um, and so this is perhaps somebody who's starting to get their foot in the door. Do you guys run internships? Do you, do you have relationships with people like that and let people in? Yeah, we do. Um, we've done, uh, we had three month internship programs. Um, and we actually stopped because we didn't have enough space in the current office for another desk. Um, but we have done them. Um, and actually most of the interns that we've worked for um, have been so amazing that they ended up working for the company. So Carly and 
Carly and Jack um, both interned and now work for communion. Um, I think it's a really great way of, of getting into a company um, and learning, learning about what they do and whether it's part of the industry that you want to get into. Um, yeah. So we have done them in the past. We haven't, we haven't got any available at the moment, but it will be something that we uh, revisit when we're all back in the office. Yeah. So similar situation here. Yeah. We, we have done them. Can who was interning with us uh, last year for six months uh, on a paid internship, just joined the team after it as well. So it's, it's definitely a good way in when there's, when there's space. There's a practical question. Um, might be a very short answer. Do you sign artists to exclusivity deals at small gigs or do they stay through loyalty? I've never heard of promoters at smaller levels signing contract or being able to. No, nope. we don't have any contracts with any artists. It's only on a show by show basis. Those sort of bigger deals will come in when your or that one big promoter will do sort of big advance payments and and have to sign bands basically recoup across multiple markets. But no, we don't. The band sort of remains loyal. Um, and it's the same, like lots of bands don't have, uh, like agents and managers and bands don't have contracts. A lot of it is done on handshakes. I think it's moving, it's, it's moving out of that now, but in the past, you know, that's why people have moved around a lot because there, you know, there are no contracts. It's all about loyalty and relationships. Yeah. There's a question, uh, oh, you know, do you think, think things can't get worse, but we've also got Brexit coming. There's a question about visas. You both work with international acts and so on. So. I mean, in a nutshell, uh, how are you feeling about visas? <laughs> That's the best way to ask that question. Do we, do we, do we know exactly what I've, I've actually kind of lost track with Brexit because COVID happened in the meantime. So I'm not even, sure, I'm not even sure anymore what that means. Um, I might even need a visa for myself because I'm French. So yeah, I, I don't know. Do we need, do you know more, Maz? I honestly don't know. No, I mean, we, we work with um, an external party that sort out visas and it's generally always been the agent that has sorted out the visas. So the promoter has, we've, we've always tried to stay away from it because it's scary stuff. You don't want to be the person that's fucked up the visa and the band are at sort of security and can't get in. Um, so, um, but again, yeah, it's, I think it's going to be even more complicated, but I agree with, with Clemence, like, no, I don't think there's been any sort of focus on that over the past few months as everyone tries to work out whether their own business is going to survive and when there will be a sort of gradual reintroduction of live music, which still feels fairly far away at the moment. Yeah. It's normally, visas normally sit with the agent. Sometimes a promoter might be asked to be a signatory or something. That's generally the experience. I understand. We, we are actually uh, sponsors of the certificate of sponsorship. Um, so we do it for a lot of our artists, especially for European agents who don't necessarily uh, want sponsors because they, you actually need to be UK based. So that, that helps them. But it's yeah. been easy in the past. I just don't really know how it's going to evolve um, going forward. One of the questions, one of the things that's been brought up just as an aside within the AIP membership is a lot of people who deal with international acts have talked about how we could be involved in trying to improve, I can't remember what it stands for, foreign entertainment, FEU, that the foreign, yeah, because that is, for those that work, once you start working with those acts, the, the department at HMRC seems to be like perhaps one poor soul is having to try and deliver it. So it, it feels like it's something we could collectively help bring about some better change. Um, so that everyone gets paid quicker. Um, we're coming to the end now. Uh, sorry, I'm getting questions through in, in, in all these different ways. I'm just trying to take it on. Um, there's a, I think you sort of touched upon this, but there's a question about how will the industry, in, how will it in the industry innovate to survive COVID-19? So it's just forgetting, I guess, like we, ignoring that we need government to put money in and um, what, 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 what VAT reductions we might get. What does the industry itself need to be considering and doing um to get through this uh bloody hell that's a hard one i think um i think there just needs everyone just needs to share risk um a little bit more i feel like the promoters have constantly been taking a lot of risk um and it needs to be it needs to be shared across all aspects of that chain from artist to manager to agent to promoter um, 
that's a quick answer from me. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you've got more Clemence. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely a good point. Um, I mean, more, more technically, there's obviously the, the live streams that are that are a solution that a few people are looking at. Um, I don't really know if this is where we want to be going. So these are still kind of ongoing discussions as well. Um, I still I still really feel like I, I just want to be in a room with people. Um, yeah. But but there's there's a lot of technological innovation on that front, obviously, at the moment. Um, yeah, um, I, I guess, yeah, just trying to, I think, I think it's going to be focusing on sustainability for everyone and just trying to get everyone to work towards a model that um, is economically and environmentally sustainable i think um which which is a good because these are subjects that are very difficult to to um to tackle on when you're working um every day and you need actually time to think things through um so this is a good time to think about all of this yeah i do i do think there there will be a hybrid model moving forward in terms of shows and streaming um hopefully I think most venues have said they're not going to open with social distancing restrictions in place because it will mean that they'll be losing money. But moving forward, let's say we have a, f a full venue, we're also going to be able to, as promoters, if the venue has in-house capabilities to stream the show, to be able to sell stream tickets. Dermot Kennedy did a show last night at the Natural History Museum. Yes, it was a Natural History Museum, but he sold about 25,000 stream tickets. And I think some of these smaller bands that might be able to add another five to 10 grand to their show p &L because they've done a stream from Lafayette in London or from Shepherd's Bush Empire and someone in Uzbekistan can watch or someone in New Delhi can watch. I think there's a slightly different model uh, moving forward, um, which could ultimately mean more sort of money in the pot for everyone along the chain. Um, I'd like to see that. And I think that might be that might be that's definitely achievable but we obviously need to get gigs back first yeah that's a good and i think that's one of the things i feel that people are talking about maybe needs to be talked about more is that historically for those people who don't know historically a lot of all that grassroots independent emerging artists they were able to go on the road because they were they had subsidies they had tour what was called tour support from record labels um, to go out because if they went out they would sell records and that's where the money was once that began to go the live sector has kind of eaten itself really the artists needed more so they put a squeeze on the promoters so the versus deal again connell was reflecting on doing deals at 60 and 70 percent you've talked today about doing deals at 80 and 85 percent he used to have a promoter fee was a standard in a line that's gone and now it's a versus deal so the you know, the artists have put squeeze on the agents who put a squeeze on the promoter who have put a squeeze on the venues. And we know all of our venues, grassroots venues are struggling. Well, why is that? It's because of that knock on effect. But over this period, we're now in a conversation as well. Actually, where is all the streaming money? You know, so live should stop eating itself and work collectively to go, OK, first of all, you know, um, what's recorded music and streaming doing? Can't you be supporting artists better? And the broken record campaign is a good, you know, there's clearly something to be seen and done there and live should support that change but then also this can't just keep eating itself um maybe the government should support and other people should support um and we should stop all pushing each other because we um we need promoters we need artists we need agents we need the whole ecosystem um we're nearly out of time there's a question thoughts on well, there's loads of questions but i'm just seeing one here which is any thoughts on the recent test run gigs there's been a couple of gigs um, in the last week uh, to try and demonstrate what social distance gigs looks like. Any thoughts on that? Will you be doing socially distanced gigs anytime soon? No, let's get gigs back at full capacities because it doesn't work for anyone. Um, no one in that supply chain benefits, promoter, venue, agent, manager, let's focus on trying to get everything back at a, a, a full capacity, I would say. Um, we've been having huge discussions. I mean, Clemence and I are on weekly calls about it. Um, John, we've been talking about it a lot. The venues don't want to open at reduced capacities. Um, you know, if, 
if you can sit on a plane next to someone um, for 12 hours and if you can get on the tube, um, what's the difference? I know there is a difference, but like we need to push to try and get, get shows back. It's so difficult. It's such a tricky time. Um, you know, we'll get through it. And I'm, I'm so positive that we're going to have a thriving independent sector uh, moving forward, but we all just need to keep on pushing and try and get, try, try and get our gigs back. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, will, I, I like to finish on time. So we're finished 1230 like, cause otherwise there's a penalty. Um, you've done a show at the O2. It's a massive penalty if you overrun, right? Yeah. Yeah. They've got a huge sort of, it's like, I don't know how much, how, how much it is per minute. But, 10, yeah. minutes or something. Yeah, it's mad. I, yeah. I saw the chief operator do a talk at an event and it's there t- in the interest to make sure people can get the tubes and go home. But is, um, they have a couple of artists who've got the money who go, oh, I'm just going to do half an hour extra <laughs> at the cost of half a million. So we're not going to do that. Um, so thank you to Maz and Clemence for, for being our, um, the masters and sharing the knowledge. Thank you to everybody who's been watching. Thank you for all the questions. Um, And sorry, we didn't get to answer all of them. We didn't have enough time. Thank you to Atom, who are the people, uh, the promoters in Worthing, great independent promoters, uh, whose Ali Pali Day will come, I hope, (laughs) sometime soon. Um, And to Arts Council England, who funded that and funded Atom, uh, who came to us to to do these. And these will be online and available for um, people to watch again and uh, share so that's it uh, thank you very much um tom will tom will take us off the internet goodbye thanks guys thanks tom thanks john